people are still rolling in from breakfast, so I'll start slowly. We'll see how that goes. Let's see. Do we have the slides up? I saw them appear and then disappear. All right, well, we'll while we're working on that, um, I'm here today with Rob Clark from HP. My name is Brian Payne, and I'm from Nebula. And this, what we're talking to you about today really started at the last summit. Um, I had given a talk on measuring attack surface areas for the cloud, and Rob came up afterwards, and we started chatting about all the security work that needs to happen. And over the course of the past six months, we sort of figured out that perhaps what's needed is this notion of an OpenStack security group. And so we're back here today to talk about it and um, to give you a sense of how we're thinking about it and hopefully to, um, to kick off an effort. So you know, my, my not so subtle goal here is to try to get uh, people excited about it, try to get people involved, and see if we can get more people contributing to uh, security aspects of OpenStack. So, to get there, I'm going to start on a little bit of a tangent. Um, and then I, I promise to come back to the OpenStack security group at some point before you guys leave the room, you know, by, by noon. Uh, so, OK. I used to live in a neighborhood that was in an up-and-coming part of town, right? Um, it was a nice neighborhood, but the area around it was still up-and-coming. And of course, everyone thinks of their homes in their neighborhood as something like a fortress on a hill, right? Nothing can ever go wrong. Nothing bad can ever happen to me. Unfortunately, shortly after I moved into the neighborhood, we started to see lots of this. Um, so the neighborhood wasn't filled out yet. There weren't a lot of people around. Um, people would run into the neighborhood, do a smash and grab at our clubhouse and take a TV. And of course, we'd just put another TV in there, hoping that it would never happen again. And they would say, oh, a great new TV. I'm going to take that one, too. And so this process would repeat. And what starts to happen is we, we start to go through this process mentally in the neighborhood, and everyone's kind of starting to get panicky and paranoid and thinking, well, what can I do to protect my house? I don't want my house to be broken into. And so what, what do you do? Well, of course, you go into Google, and you start searching for how do I protect my house? What do I do? Well, certainly, you need to install an alarm system, right? So, uh, so lots of people in the neighborhood went out and got an alarm system. Um, but then there were those that had spent a little more time on Google and said, well, all these little switches that you put in your house for the alarm system by your windows and by your doors, apparently you can just put a magnet next to the switch, open the door, and the alarm doesn't go off. Well, that's, that's troubling. So maybe an alarm system is good, but maybe it's not perfect. So maybe I need something else. So you start researching more, and you say, ah, oh, put bars on my window, except they're, they're not terribly pretty. And uh, you know people have mixed opinions about them. And then there's always the question about how do you do bars if you need to escape in a fire. And, and so the more you research these, you say, well, this, this may not be too ideal either. And it turned out in our neighborhood, we had these beautiful like 16-foot windows in our houses, and, and no one wanted to put bars on their big windows. So what else do you do? Well, you know, a lot of us had dogs. And I love dogs. This is actually my dog. Um, dogs are great. And dogs are, can be a good security mechanism, right? Of course, if it's my dog, you just throw some food at her, and then you're in. So it's not really a big deal. Um, I suspect other dogs are like that, too. So, so you say, OK, well, let's go high tech. right? We're, we're a technical crowd. Let's put a security camera up. And, uh, and I actually read a story online where someone had put security cameras in their house, and they would monitor them online while they were at work. And at one point, they actually caught someone breaking into their house, called the police. The police came over, caught the guys took them to jail. They didn't lose any of their stuff. It sounds, sounds ideal. Of course, you have to be watching the security camera all the time. And it's kind of expensive. And then you start to realize, well, the security cameras often produce images like this. They're kind of blurry. And of course, the bad guys are going to wear masks. And if you're not watching the footage, all you see is a nice recording of your house getting broken into and probably nothing more to go on. OK, so it's exciting. It's high tech. You could even maybe run your video streams through OpenStack. But Maybe it's not exactly what you want. And so, well, I guess you could just move, right? So you could use some technology to figure out where to move to. And this is, this is a heat map, actually, of the area that we're in in San Diego showing the crime rates overlaid um, on top of the areas. And so you could look at a map like this, and you could say, well, I'm right in the mi middle of that red zone. Maybe I want to move down to the green zone. But that's not perfect, right? Because you're maybe wanting to live in the red zone for a reason. Maybe you like to be able to walk to work. You know, There's more to life than having your house broken into. So, 
all of a sudden, Don, you're, you're looking at all this stuff, and you step back and you realize, well, this is actually kind of hard. How do I prevent someone from breaking into my house? Right? And so you go out and you talk with your neighbors, you beat your head against the wall, and you just realize that maybe you moved to this neighborhood for a reason, and maybe you need to, to sort of find some sort of risk acceptance level, right? Figure out what can I live with, how do I make things a little bit better, but realize that it's never gonna be perfect from a you, you can't prevent someone from breaking into your house, perhaps. So you start to get a little philosophical and you start to wonder how to proceed. Um, and, th and the point here is that it's kind of similar in the world of software, right? So in the world of software, I just went on and pulled some headlines from the past year, and it's, it's kind of both sad and remarkable, all the things that we've seen happening. Um, RSA, for example, I don't know how many of you carry these RSA hardware security tokens on you. Um, I see a few hands. So um, RSA was broken into back in 2011, and um, some information was stolen that would allow people to basically impersonate these hardware tokens. Um, and then there was another story I flashed up there that people basically turned around and used that information to break into Lockheed Martin. So, you know, I mean, these are relatively sophisticated attacks, and how do we protect ourselves against this, right? These are other companies that you're relying on to get your, your job done. Um, just recently, um, White House had a, a military network, an unclassified military network that was hacked into. It made big news splashes because the organization that the network belonged to also happened to be responsible for sending things like nuclear weapons codes around. But don't be too worried because the network that was broken into, of course, was not that network. It just happened to be the same organization's network. Um, Suffice it to say, computer security incidents are happening everywhere. Um, here we are at the OpenStack Summit, and we're all involved in creating this framework for cloud that is getting adopted very, very rapidly, right? I mean, it's, it's still a relatively immature product. Um, I was just talking with someone before about it's sort of a curse and a blessing. So it's been adopted so fast that we've got APIs, for example, that are, that are getting hard to change. Right, because you have so many people that are using an API, so if there's a problem with it, changing it now isn't a matter of, you know, a dev going in and just flipping a bit and saying, oh, now it's better. We have to think about all the users that are now using this and how do we migrate them from A to B and get them to be more secure. So the, the longer we wait to get into these problems and really address them, the harder it's going to be. Um, so... There we are. Okay. Finally, there's this question of, well, okay, what is this guy talking about? OpenStack. No one's going to actually want to break into OpenStack, right? And hopefully this is kind of like a, a funny slide, but, but in the event, <laughs> I, I've, I've actually spoken with a fair number of people this week that have asked me questions like, well, you know, does security really matter? Like, what sort of workloads? I mean, people are running private clouds. It's behind a firewall. Maybe we don't care. Um, and, you know, my answer to this is, I think it, I think it does matter deeply, right? So, we have all sorts of people that are running workloads on OpenStack, and as soon as those workloads become anything important, then it matters, right? Is a bank gonna deploy OpenStack? Is an institution working with um, medical data, doing maybe biomedical research, going to deploy OpenStack? Uh, is a government gonna deploy OpenStack? Are you gonna deploy it and put your personal data on it, right? I think the answer to all of these questions is yes, and at differing degrees, security matters. And it matters differently for each of these groups. And so one of the challenges in creating something like OpenStack is to figure out how do we create the security knobs and dials so that people that want to deploy like high performance computing workloads on it and have zero latency and just you know, completely scream can do what they want to do, but the people that want rock solid security and are willing to give up some performance can also do what they want to do. And so these are real challenges. Um, and these are down the road challenges because today, the question is, how do we get a baseline of security in here that really I would argue that everyone needs or should need? So generally when people ask this question, I love this picture, I just, you know, I try not to bang my head against the wall, but sometimes I have to. Okay. So I know several of you came into this room wanting to hear about OpenStack Security Group. And you're now you're probably thinking, okay, too much motivation, let's move on with it. So for those of you, I am finally, finally there. And we're going to move on. But um, I appreciate you waiting. And hopefully, by having a little bit of an intro, I was able to sort of bring everyone on a little bit to the same page. And if you still don't agree with me that security is useful or that security is hard, um, I'm happy to bang my head against the wall with you somewhere after the session. All right, so, so what do we know? Um, 
what do we know about security? Well, I sort of listed some things sort of better and worse um, as far as how you would go about approaching security here. Um, in an ideal world, you design security in from the start, right? And we've all done this. Anyone that's worked for a commercial company, the very first thing you do when you start designing a product is you think about how it's going to be secure, right? That's how it always works. No, unfortunately not. Um, but that's okay. That doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, but I think the, the longer you wait, the harder it gets, right? So, and, and we're starting to hit an inflection here with OpenStack, where I think if we don't, don't start acting a little more quickly, uh, we might run into some really big challenges. Um, okay, understanding your threats. So these next two things that I talked about, understanding your threats and understanding your goals. Um, it goes towards what exactly do you do in security? So a common problem that I run into is you talk to folks and they say, oh my God, I need security. I should encrypt this. I should authenticate that. I should you know, change the file permissions here. These might all be good things to do. Uh, but have you stepped back and have you thought about what are you trying to protect against? What, what is this hypothetical attacker that's gonna come into your system, how are they gonna hit your system, and how are the changes that you're proposing gonna actually prevent this attacker from getting in? And um, a common mistake is to be so worried about the really high-end security stuff and completely overlook the obviousness that you know, maybe there's a vulnerability where anyone can connect without authorizing and you're sitting here worried about you know, encrypting your backend data stores. Um, so you, you have to balance it, you have to understand who you're protecting against and you have to be a little smart about how you apply your resources to the problem. And you can't just pour on security, right? And finally, the one thing that, I, that I've seen as well is I think you need a certain level of a security culture to achieve traction with this stuff. And so what we're here talking about today is the idea of starting up an OpenStack security group, but I don't want to give the impression that my feeling is that we can somehow magically have a group of 5, 10, 20 security folk, and then everyone else dealing with OpenStack can just forget about it because we'll have it under control. Um, I don't think that's how it works. And I think uh, there's plenty of evidence to that point if you look back at different organizations. Um, the one that I always like to draw from is if you look at Microsoft. Um, back in around 2002, there was this huge mandate at Microsoft. Um, do we have any Microsoft employees in the room? I'll let you tell the story instead, right? Okay, good, so I can just make this up. Um, <laughs> so back in around 2002, uh, Microsoft was really getting beat up from a security standpoint. And, um, and, and I would argue that to this day, there is still sort of a, a doubt in a lot of people's minds. Or they, you know, you hear Microsoft, you say, mm, I don't know how I feel about their security. But the fact of the matter is, they came down from the very top level in the organization at that time and said, security matters, and we're gonna change how we do things, right? We're not gonna release a product unless the security guys say it's okay. Um, we're gonna change all of our development practices. And they spent a ton of time and effort working on this to the point where if you actually look at some of their products that are coming out you know, now and over the past several years, they are way, way better. They've done a really good job. And it started because they changed the culture, right? And so, um, that's, I think, even harder to do when you're looking at something like OpenStack, because we don't have the OpenStack CEO that can come down and say, security matters, thou shall do it. Right? We have a community of disparate interests and, and people, and so, um, so you know, we just can't do that. Um, but hopefully we can find enough of a critical mass. Right? There's been social science research that says that if you take an idea and you get 10% of a community really behind a certain idea, then that's enough. If they are really, really excited about this idea, from 10% threshold, you can then spread that to the rest of the community pretty easily. So we don't have to necessarily just take over OpenStack by storm, but you know, there's 1,400 people at the conference. I don't think we have 140 people in this room, so I'm gonna need some, some help here to get the word out, right? Okay. So where are we today? Um, what have I seen? And, and I'll readily admit, so I, you know, this is a little bit of an outsider coming in. I've, I've been involved with OpenStack for about half a year now. And, um, but th this, is, this is what I've seen, and I've spent a lot of time talking with folks, and I think it's, it's uh, not an inaccurate view. So. Um, so we have a vulnerability management team, and I think they're doing a good job. So they're responsible for um, handling reported vulnerabilities that come in. So if, um, if someone finds a security problem in any of the OpenStack products, they manage it from the perspective of you don't want the whole world to know about it right away. You sort of have to understand the problem, release the patch, and, and do all this stuff in a nice, in a nice fashion. So they've been doing, I think, a, a decent job. Um, of course, I have my comic here on the right. 
uh, that security patching is hard, right? So you often want to do a small change to fix a security problem, and often it has cascading effects that you don't realize and stuff. And so at the end of the day, you really want to make sure that your system is built for security from the ground up, and that you're not just putting out fires every time someone brings it to your attention. But the other thing that I find very promising that I've really started to see at this summit is there's a lot of people walking around talking about maybe we need to do something about security. I dropped in on all the sessions that I had time for this week where there was something related to security in the title, right? So things like encrypting uh, Swift backends or, um, or things like you know, getting better authentication for RPC packets. And it's really nice to see that people are starting to realize that security is something that we need to think about. Um, on the downside, I think a lot of the people that are thinking about security um, would benefit from talking with folks who have done more security work, right? So security is really hard, and it goes back to my slide of hitting your head against the wall. Um, it's so easy to get things wrong, and Rob's gonna talk a little bit about this later too. Um, but you can get really brilliant people, put them in a room, they can come up with an idea that just, just makes perfect sense on that whiteboard, and, uh, and then you go implement it, and then six months later, someone finds the little weakness in it, right? And then, and then deploy it. And that's why there's this whole history of like best practices in the world of security where, where um, certain technologies, certain ideas in the world of security are sort of tested and thought to be a little more bulletproof. And there's certain axioms like you don't invent your own cryptography, right? You use known good stuff. Um, and so, so I think understanding this and having security experts be able to help guide the thinking as we get down this path would be very, very useful. Okay. Um, I think I've hit on a lot of these, but um, the, the one, one thing that I think is worth mentioning is this notion of security as silos. So there's a lot of different projects with OpenStack. Um, you know, we have Swift and Nova and Glance and Quantum and all these different projects. And I would argue that it's not sufficient to have each of those projects thinking about security all by themselves without talking to others. Because what's going to happen is they might, they might go down different paths, they might be incompatible with each other. Um, you might create a user experience that just isn't acceptable, right? What if, what if the um, type of tool for encryption you need to connect to Quantum is totally different than the type of tool you need for connecting to Nova? All of a sudden the user is just having this collection of tools and they can't keep them up to date and there's just problems. So there's all these issues where you really need to look at security deep inside each project, but you also need to be able to look across the whole spectrum and think about how it works and how it gets installed, how it gets deployed, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so OpenStack Security Group. Sort of, Rob and I have been viewing this as sort of a, a dual-prong thing. The goal here is to see if we can create a group of people that can serve as a security expert resource within the OpenStack community. And um, to really have this happen, we need People that are good at security to step up and be able to help, all right? So if you are one of those people, if you know those people, if you have people like that working for you and you want to help OpenStack be better, um, you know, let's, let's come together and I'll have some contact information at the end about how we can move forward on this. But the other side is equally important, and that's building a security culture. So this is going to happen by people doing code reviews and commenting on security problems, right, and, and making suggestions for improvements. It's gonna happen by people proposing architectural changes that will improve security. It's gonna happen by people actually implementing those architectural changes and, and really making that positive change themselves. Um, it's gonna happen by better documentation, right? Ways that we can make it easier for people to deploy OpenStack securely from the start, um, even if they're a novice. So all these things need to happen, um, and that's part of the community culture, right? And so, um, I had this slide that was full of words, and I, I don't like words on slides when I can avoid it. So I just created this graphic, and at the end, it's almost obnoxiously high level, but that's okay. So the idea here is, is that we would lead through doing all these different things, right? So it provides security leadership by helping it redesign where it needs to be redesigned. And that, that could be long-term things, if it's architectural or API changes, et cetera. Um, writing documentation, writing code, implementing code, all these things. Um, become very important, and really just providing that resource, right? So if you're, if you're extending a, a protocol and you're gonna add security bits to it and you're not sure if you're doing it the right way, well, you should be able to ping some security folk and say, well, does this look good? Can you review this for me? Hopefully before it even gets implemented, right? Okay, um, I'll just go through this somewhat quickly, but I wanted to have at least some slightly more concrete details. 
Um, the notion that, that we've been thinking of this is that we'd like to have at least one, hopefully more, security people that are really assigned to each project, right? So you'd have like a Nova security expert who could live deep in that project, understand the guts of the projects, contribute code to that project, and, and be sort of the go-to security guy for deep Nova issues. Um, and same thing for each of the other projects. But you'd also have people that are sort of higher level people who see across all the projects. And the idea is then have these deep dive people and the higher level people all in communication so you can be aware of ver various security issues that are happening. And I mentioned documentation up here as well. Maybe you'd have someone assigned to a documentation team. Maybe you'd have this higher level person do this. Um, I, I don't know the best way to approach that. If there's any documentation folks in the room, I'd love to get a sense of how that's, how that's working right now in OpenStack and how to best plug in there. Um, and we already have a mailing list that's up. So um, there's a mailing list on Launchpad um, for the group. We currently have it as a closed list, and that is really just so that we have the ability to help the vulnerability management team talk about things that might still be you know, locked down. Um, but um, we can certainly have more open uh, security discussions in all the normal channels, the dev lists and all that kind of stuff. And the idea is that we'd be monitoring that as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, so on one hand, it's hard. It, you, you know, I can't like pen test uh, something in the middle of CI, but there are things that you can do. Um, you, can, you can look for you know, problems in the code base that you know, might be bad. You can look for people setting file permissions wrong. Um, you, you can look for sort of basic things. Um, if, if there's a move, so that there was, for example, a talk at um, the OpenStack Commons session the other day about taking some of the root wrap functionality and moving it into commons and then making sure that all the individual projects didn't have their own sort of forked version of it. Um, once people make that migration, you could then check and just make sure that people always use that one and not the old one or something. So um, just little things even, just to sort of make sure that things stay clean and crisp. Okay, so I'm gonna transition a little bit here and, um, and try to further motivate why cross-project is useful, um, and, and why even we need some security help today. And um, I'm gonna give just one case study real quick here, and then I'm gonna ask Rob to come up, and he's got some thoughts from, um, from this week at the summit, so it'll be more recent information. Um, so I drew this picture here. This, this is a current state of affairs. Um, if you are deploying an OpenStack cloud, and you wanna make sure that you're talking to the cloud via HTTPS, you might deploy something that looks a little like this, and again, I've, I've gone high level just to make it easy, but you might have some sort of HTTPS endpoint that all the clients connect to, and then it's backed by all your various OpenStack services. So let's imagine you wanted to do that today. And why would you want to do that, of course? There's security UUIDs and other things flying across the network that if someone grabs onto, you know, it's gonna mess up your security. So I would hope that everyone would be thinking about this. Um, the problem, is that while your web browser will do a really great job with, with SSL these days, because of course that's sort of bread and butter on the internet, um, when you start to go down through the, the OpenStack command line clients, you quickly realize that they have some fundamental problems with regards to support for this. What I didn't even mention on here is that most of these clients um, don't support TLS. So if, you're, um, if your endpoint is, is TLS and greater, which is really a sort of best practices today, I would argue, um, then you're gonna just not be able to work with the clients. So first thing you have to do is downgrade your endpoint to like SSL v2 or SSL v3, and then you've got these clients, and the clients have problems where you can't give them your own certificate chains, for example. So let's say you're a corporation who maintains your own PKI because you don't necessarily trust you know, VeriSign or any of the outside chains, or just, just because this is sort of how you've decided to do things, and um, you then need to provide your own company's root CA chain into these tools to verify that everything is correct. Well, currently the tools don't allow you to do that. And that's, you know, that's troubling. Um, similarly, one of them, oh yeah, the Swift client today, um, is not even checking the, the server CA certificate. So basically it will connect and it will see that there's an SSL connection there and then it will just proceed. It won't do any certificate checking which means it would be really easy to do sort of an active man-in-the-middle attack on that connection. You're sort of encrypting to who knows who. <laughs> um, 
Um, it's perhaps better than not encrypting, but it's not, not ideal. So um, suffice it to say, um, this is sort of a pretty straightforward cross-project problem. And to address this problem, to really get past this, we're going to have to step into each one of these tools and fix them one by one. And it's not until they're all fixed that we'll be able to actually turn on that HTTPS endpoint to you know, TLS v1 with you know, strong certificates and expect it to work and work nicely. So that's just one example of going cross-project. I'm going to hand it off to Rob here for a few more thoughts. So thanks to Brian, who will be back up to close out this talk. Uh, my name's Rob Clark. I'm a cloud security architect for HP. We have a pretty big public cloud. Um, because of that, we're really concerned about security and OpenStack. How many people here have a security responsibility in some form within OpenStack? OK, that's good. So that's about a third of people. So everybody else is either interested in security or in the wrong room, right? <laughs> Every talk I've been to this week has ended up in a discussion about crypt, about authentication, about authorization. All the different parts within OpenStack, especially internally, are really lacking or deficient in at least one of these parts. And we really, really need to fix that. Because one of the things we've noticed is that as a public cloud, we're worried about everything. We're very paranoid. We think things are going to break. We expect bad people in the data center from time to time. Things get compromised. That's life. We need to plan around it. And for a long time, OpenStack's been kind of blinkered to this, I feel, when you look at some of the design work. But what's really been noticeable at this summit is how many people who are involved in private deployments and in small-scale deployments are coming to us and saying, we have these same problems. We can see that in a year or two, we're going to do this. We've got more and more customers standing up private clouds to support internet-facing functions. There's a lot of people that are starting to see the problems that we see coming. And there's, a more, there's more on that in another session later today. But I just wanted to point out it's really good to see everybody coming together on the security stuff. Unfortunately. What's happening is everybody's coming together and talking about how they need security, how really important it is. And almost always, they go straight to crypt. Now, I like to think I understand crypt to a certain extent. Does anyone know what that is? What sort of function it is? No? OK, it's a hash function. Understanding a hash function is a good way of not screwing things up. Understanding what a hash function actually does is important. Very, very few people understand what a hash function actually does. I'm not a mathematician. I find this stuff incredibly hard to learn. And the strap line at the bottom there is important. Okay? What we don't want to do is be in a position where everybody rushes to deploy a bunch of security. They take a look at Wikipedia. They see what a hash function does, right? You take a big, data, big lump of data. You put it together. You apply a function in there. You can prove that the data you've been presented, as long as the hash, which came out of band from the data, otherwise it could have been tampered in line, you can marry those two up and mathematically assert that, one, that they match, that it's right. Unless your data that goes into the hash function is formed in a way that it gets parsed beforehand or something like that. And people screw this up. People screw this up really badly. Really, really smart people screw it up. So OAuth, OAuth version 1 had a couple of guys from Twitter and a couple of other places who wanted to implement some really cool sort of 2.0 type functionality. These guys are incredibly smart and can write code way, way better than I could ever write. Okay? And they, they, they screwed up pretty badly. Like the session fixation attacks in OAuth are really bad. And it was a while before people noticed them. And basically, it meant that all the security foundation that you wanted from that went away. And then you end up moving to OAuth 2.0, and you actually end up leveraging SSL for most of that stuff. And it turned out that you know, a cool idea for doing things ended up being quite painful. Amazon Web Services, they're. Uh, one of their early versions of their message signing stuff was vulnerable because, again, it comes back to not understanding the crypt that it's being, as it's being applied. And this goes for any security mechanism, but these are two examples that were easy to pull up uh, that affect cloud-type services, and two examples where it was easy to demonstrate with crypt. So Amazon Web Services, uh, when you send certain messages, what happened is the message was parsed and split up in a certain way, then all uh, concatenated together and hashed and sent. Now, that sounds 
perfectly sensible. And if you write that down on a piece of paper and show it to a developer, they'll say, yeah, it's great, I'll go do it. They may even go and check which hashing function to use and decide, actually, I probably won't use MD5 because I heard about something bad with that, and I'll go and use SHA or whatever. But there was a vulnerability in there whereby uh, any malicious attacker could pretty much put anything they wanted into the messaging because of the way collision attacks have happened in hashing. Now, again, I'm, I'm not a mathematician. I can't sit there and write you a new algorithm to do collision attacks but I work in this space. When you show me data that's being parsed and, and put back together before it's being sent, I can tell you that's not a great idea and I can point to the reasons why. And so can the other guys that we've got in the security group at the moment. Now the OpenStack security group at the moment is quite small. Uh, it's, as uh, Brian says, it's a closed group. So we have a closed mailing list at the moment because we do some interaction with the VMT and uh, they might come to us and say, well, we've seen a vulnerability of type X that's been reported from the community and we need to understand how bad it is. Um, this group that we have, you know, we've got Brian coming from Nebula, and if someone knows what Nebula does, that's great, but <laughs> he understands how it affects them in the way they work in the private cloud. And I understand how it will work for me in the public cloud, because we have entirely different sets of threat actors. So we can then provide sort of well-reasoned feedback to VMT on how to work on this stuff. But what we want to do is be in a position where when we've brought in enough sort of core talent, enough people who have demonstrated their ability to work in this space and to make good decisions and work well with others, then we can open this up and it can become a resource whereby those of you here that you know, are interested in this talk, you're not necessarily directly responsible for security stuff, but you're here and you want to learn about security, you can start subscribing to the security group, you can start getting involved in interaction, and you can challenge the things we're saying and say, well, why doesn't this work? Or what about this other way? Because security is a constant space of innovation. So. Um, I just wanted to quickly touch on these two. I didn't really want to beat these guys up because plenty of people in this room will have made mistakes similar to they have. Uh, Brian made a very good point about not reinventing stuff. There are really good mechanisms out there. So we just want to help people use the right one. Thanks. All right, so thanks, Rob. Um, I've just got, I think, one more slide. Let's see. Yeah, so next steps, we're hiring. <laughs> um, I put hiring in quotes because I don't think we're really paying, um, but you know, <laughs> it's open source. So, um, but, but the key point is here, this is not gonna happen with a few select people. We need community involvement. We need, we need more than HP and Nebula. Um, we need lots of people that care coming together, working on this problem at different levels. So even if you're not quite ready to do a full on commitment to you know, joining the group or coding stuff up or whatever it is that suits your fancy, um, we need your help. We need you at least to be raising your hand in meetings and saying, what about the security of that? And, uh, and please feel free to come to us and, and talk to us more, express your interest, and we'll see how we can link you in best, okay? Um, but what would be really great is if you fall into any of these categories, like a security engineer, tech writer, or even someone who has operational experience deploying OpenStack, um, people with security hats in any of these domains is really, really useful to sort of infuse this knowledge throughout the community. So that, that would be fantastic. With that, I'm just gonna leave some information up here about um, how to contact Rob and myself and how to find out more information on the group. And, uh, and I'm happy to open the floor for discussion and questions. So, thank you. And Rob, you can come back up too. Because <laughs> I'm gonna defer all the questions to him. So, yeah. No, I think that makes sense. The suggestion came, right, so the suggestion came from within the group a while back as well that, um, that probably most of our chatter should just happen on the dev list, right, um, where all the rest of the chatter happens. And I think that's a very reasonable suggestion. Um, we're not gonna get rid of the closed list because there are times when that's gonna be a useful mechanism for us, but, um, but I, don't, I don't suspect that that's gonna be like where we go for 100% of our communication. That's right. 
And, and this would only reinforce that. <laughs> but that's right. why we're not going to have a separate open security list. Every, you know, all the open stuff, we can just use the normal open stat list. That's right. So um, I'm actually a co-lead of one of the working groups for the Cloud Security Alliance um, on um, big data and, um, and attack surface analysis. Um, I think the work that they do is largely complementary to what we're proposing here today. Um, CSA does a lot of sort of white papers and sort of um, pushing the field to think about what research needs to happen in the space, um, perhaps a little more forward thinking, whereas I think something like OSSG is going to be a little more rubber meets the road, let's make OpenStack you know, secure as we deploy it. So I think they both play an important role, but it's just a different, different slice. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, we have we have a large public cloud based off of OpenStack. Yeah. Right now, some of them we have to say. You, you, you'll need to come back in a little while, the stuff we're working on. We have a whole bunch of tactical security stuff in place at different points in our infrastructure to compensate for some of the problems we see in OpenStack. And I have a talk a little while later on how we move from that to actually pushing some of this innovation out and working with the community to, to raise the bar. And a, the OSSG will be a big part of that. But yeah, we have a public cloud. The public cloud, based on OpenStack, does have certain problems, and we're working hard to try and solve them. I'm not in it personally. I think some of our strategists probably are. Um, I know we definitely have representation on the CSA, for example. Um, it's certainly something I can look into if you, if you want. If you drop me your card and we'll, we'll talk about it more. Um, let's go over here. Yeah, so um, I, I think the answer is unfortunately no. Um, <laughs> no, you're right. And, and uh, one thing, th there's all sorts of discussions about how to best do this, right? There's this middle ground between bug and vulnerability report, right? Where you see something that's sort of a weakness, but it's not exploitable today. But so do you file a bug? Do you file? And, and there's some process questions that I think we need to resolve. There's a lot of, what's the word, just sort of community knowledge. Where, where if you go around talking with people, a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, I saw this thing in OpenStack, and it's really terrible. You should, <laughs> you should watch out. And we need to get that, yeah, we need to get that down. Yeah, well, I'd like to get that into the bug system, but, but you're right. It would be nice to have, have some initial things, too. Um, what, one more thought real quick on that is, is there was a talk, an uh, idea that came up the, uh, the other day about um, apparently you can tag um, certain code reviews and stuff today with, let's say, this affects documentation. And um, there's an interest in adding a security tag as well, which I think would be helpful. That makes sense. That's, that's quite common in a lot of big open source projects. Um, you know, you need to be able to tag this stuff. It would be great to have this list, but whenever you, get, whenever you have this discussion, developers are like, oh, we need this list, list, we need to work from it. And then you need to consider, well, I'm worried about bad guys off in Eastern Europe or, or wherever who will spend time working out how they can trampoline between these four things that individual developers in disparate groups have told me aren't a problem right now to work out how to break into our system. So you, there's always a balance to be found with this stuff. I'm all for having security out in the open. I really am. But in the same way that the VMT works, you know, they get a vulnerability and they work with project leads to get it patched up and then they disclose it. So, I absolutely think we ha should have as much in the open as we can to support developers and people who are interested in this stuff. But like with anything in security, there's always a responsible disclosure element to it. So we're, we're at, I see there's a few more questions, but we're at the end of our time. And so to respect the next session, I'm going to close this out. And I'm happy to take uh, other things offline right up front here. So thank you very much. <laughs>